several designated pharmacies that are HIV centers of excellence. And um, what those are is those are specialized pharmacies where the pharmacists have additional training in HIV um, prevention treatment. We do um, medication therapy management. We'll, we'll do a one-on-one -on -one consultation sitting outside um, with the patient to answer any of their medication-related questions. We can also refer them to social services, psychological services. We work with the community organizations, and we're just here to learn more and promote our relationships and learn how we can better serve the community. And if you want brochures about what their program does, they're out on the exhibit tables out there. Hello, my name is Lucia Bustamante. I work with UT Health Science Center. Um, we are the Part D of the Ryan White program. And the name of our organization or agency is South Texas Family AIDS Network. My name is Ana Escamilla, and I am the medical case manager with Central Med. I'm Rachel Gonzalez. I'm the director of specialty services at Central Med Center as a clinic. And we have a routine testing program at Central Med. Uh, we've been um, implementing it since August, September 2011. And Central Med is your local, one of your local federally qualified health centers. Hi, my name is Elena Martinez, and I'm a project coordinator at the Health Collaborative, and we work closely with the Ryan White program. Okay, right here. My name is Tanya Burris. I'm the director of clinical operations at the Vax Clinic. Uh, we are doing routine testing. I'm so glad there's so many UHS people here. I'm Yvonne Venegas. I'm the manager at the Vax Clinic for the case managers. <laughs> So we work directly with the HIV AIDS patients. A hip hop. I'm just kidding. My name is Matt Poe. I'm the uh, routine HIV testing coordinator for University Health System. I work out of the Fax Clinic under Tanya. Hi, I'm Sarah um, Walker, and I'm one of the nurses over at the University Southwest Clinic. Hi, I'm Aurelia Hernandez. I'm a physician assistant, um, and I'm with St. Mary's University. Thank you. Look at the diversity we have. I think you guys ought to give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for being here. I'd like to introduce um, my panel um, this afternoon. And when we talk about linkage to care and what's happening in San Antonio, we're really getting local. I think you saw this morning from um, Judge Wolf the overview of the importance of what this is. Then from Dr. Holly, who was wonderful, talking about why he does it in Beaumont and what drives him to do that. If we could, he said, uh, that hope was one of his greatest elements. Man, if we, could, if we could bottle his positive attitude and just sprinkle it in every one of the hospitals we have here, we'd have this pro we've had this pro problem licked. And then you heard from Dr. McCarthy, um, again, who's from Houston, and their system of uh, how they've set up to do routine testing and their trauma system and their emergency room. So I thought you'd like to get a local, little bit of a local flavor what are the resources? And the major resource that we have, and I think you heard earlier from um, Isabel Clark, that they had funded two routine testing sites in San Antonio. One is at Centro Med, which Rachel spoke about. It's their, um, all of their clinics. And how many do you have? 11 that do the routine testing, including the one in Comal? Right, so it's the local ones in San Antonio and one in Comal County. So we've got a rural reach with that. And then I'd like to turn it over just, just a few minutes to, um, to the back to my Bobsy twins back there. And that would be Matt and um, Tanya to say just a little bit. I'm going to start with you, Tanya, to talk a little bit about the program. Uh, Matt, I don't care who starts, about what's here. We've started routine HIV testing uh, July of 2010, um, primarily out of our emergency center and our two major urgent cares, which are the Express Med at the hospital and the Express Med downtown or the Robert Brady Green. 
<laughs> Grand Den I'm sorry, I'm having a brain fart. Um, we've since expanded to also our two university family health cares, uh, University Family Healthcare Southeast and Southwest. Um, we've, uh, you saw the numbers for 2012. Um, our incident rate is continually 0.91 percent, um, running about a 60-40 split, 60 percent previous, 40 percent no or new. Um, all age ranges, my youngest is 16, my oldest has been 63, um, from high risk factor groups and from what they perceive as no risk factor groups. So it's, uh, it's, the program works, um, it takes a lot of work to get it up and running to gain provider confidence. Um, my personal experience, uh, I notify patients who test positive through my program. Um, I also do quite a bit of the staff education through personal experience with that, the public does not have a problem with being tested, as long as it's done on a routine basis. Um, they have a problem with it when they're behind the door with the provider, and they're, they're saying, I need to check you for HIV. When you're telling the general community that we're doing it as a routine test, no one, no one is offended, no one has any prejudice towards it, and they all agree to it. So it's, um, I can, I can, Besides, you know, the general population, they'll accept it. Um, dealing with providers and past prejudices is actually quite a hassle when you're dealing with anyone in the medical community. Um, what they perceive needs to be done and what they're used to focusing on is it's quite a battle to get that sort of thing changed. And so, I just have to stand up, I can't sit down. So what I have to say is a lot of what Dr. McCarthy talked about in Houston are some of the same issues that we looked at. So educating the providers, bringing it home why this is important. Um, every year, now initially I think what were our testing numbers? We strove the very first year we were gonna test 76, or between, between 60 and 70,000. That was our goal. The first year that we implemented testing, getting everything done, it was substantially lower. It was 1,500. All right, but that's hitting at the stone. Stay, you know, stay with, stay with it. That's what I got to say. If you're if you're starting programs, uh, interestingly enough, we started to go back and look at some of the patients that um, we we had tested positive newly out of the emergency room. And one that sticks with me, and I always use this as an example. So if you've heard it before, bear with me. We had a patient who had 11 visits to the emergency center. Okay, so we can't figure out what's going out, what's going on with this man. He was diagnosed, I believe, with acute viral syndrome, um, is what we could find. He was referred to Hemonk, where Hemonk um, drew blood and did an HIV test, and we were able to get him into care. So it, it's right. We give him a medical home. We test him in the emergency center. We link him in. Matt has one of the best linkages into care in the state of Texas. We're at 88%. He does one heck of a job. We go out and we find patients. Uh, we talk to them inpatient, we talk to them outpatient, but we're doing a great job on getting them in. Of course, we'd like that number to be 100, and we're working every day to identify and link, but the point of the matter is, is stay with it. Everyone that we test and identify, you're saving that possible transmission in the community, and you're saving money because, you know, if you find them and get them into the clinic, we're keeping them out of the emergency room with PCP and, and readmits down the line. So thank you for being here. As for those of providers or associated with other outlying clinics or you know providers' offices, test your patients. Even if you don't think that your patients need the test, test your patients, and I think you'll be surprised. Thanks. Okay, you heard it straight from the horse's mouth on how it works here in San Antonio, then um, what our system is. Now, once they've identified them, where can they go? Where can they go and to link to care? What's available in care? Who's out there? Well, first of all, we have Metro Health Department, San Antonio Metropolitan Health District. And most people don't know that San Antonio Metropolitan Health District is the public health authority for the city and the county. So throughout the whole region where we go, because there's no county health department, it's San Antonio Metropolitan Health Department. And so talking a little bit about the disease intervention specialist, 
which his job is to go out and look and link and um, find, the, uh, find them and follow up. I'm going to turn it over to Sian. You're going to introduce the other person that you brought with you from Metro Health. Thank you, Sian. My name is Sian Hill. I am the field operations manager for Metro Health. So that means I am over the entire public health follow-up team, and that would include the DIS, which are the disease intervention specialists. They're responsible for going out and locating persons that are infected or suspected of being infected with an STD and or HIV. Once they locate that individual, they're then responsible for conducting an interview or obtaining a field blood so that we can run additional tests. In that interview, they will identify partners, suspects, and associates that we will then go out and attempt to locate to also render a test for. To my left is Valdemar Gonzalez. He is one of our disease intervention specialists, but he's also an OB, GYN. I'm going to let him talk for himself. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, DIS, disease intervention specialist, is not for everybody. It's a hard uh, work to do. Uh, I'm always been in the field a uh, uh, medical field. I come from Mexico. I'm OBGYN from Mexico. I'm working for being here. But meanwhile, I'm working, of course, in Metro Health Department, gave me the opportunity to work with them. So I'm working hard on that. And we know that the best way to fight some disease is not the best treatment, is the prevention of that disease occur. So the, the work for the DIS is trying to find the people before that infection will attack that person. And believe me, it's hard. Why? Of course, because the nature of the HIV and the target population who are the high risk to have the HIV, well, not everybody. It still is the stigma that everybody, they don't want to talk to them or they're are, once they know that they are HIV, they are afraid to, you know, to even being close to them. There are some people who don't accept or they're homophobic. So for have this job is, is, is hard. Now, once we found the patient which finally decides to get tested for any reason, if they want to, they, they went to the emergency room, or for a routine checkup, or because he uh, wake up and feels the, the field needing to get tested, and happens that came positive. Well, that's when we enter in the picture. We need to talk to that patient. We need to educate that patient. We need to let them know that they're not going to die because of that infection. Because right now, HIV is a chron it's considered a chronic disease. Uh, it's a lot of treatment. And a part of all that, we need to convince them to give away something really private for, for them. Who are the sexual partners? If somebody totally estranged from me and, some, and just suddenly you ask me, with, and who am I sleeping with? Well, what do you care? Man? Well, it's not your business. Well, yes, it's hard. And you know what? Yes, that's what we do every single day, not just in the clinic. We are the ones that we are active uh, trying to prevent this infection. And the hospital, at the hospitals, at the private doctors, at the public settings, well, I consider those places, yes, really good, but those are passive places where the people just go there as needed. Maybe they are, don't, don't know what is going on. Well, that's when we need to go practically take a car and look for that people, knock at the door, if we happens that we know where those they live, and try to let them know in the most private setting what is going on. We have so many very different situations. Every patient is totally different. Uh, sometimes the patient is 17 years old. The person who opened the door is the mother. And why are you looking for my son? From where you come from? Well, you need to go around all those stones, and you know what, man? You know, uh, I come from the city of San Antonio first. I need to talk to your son. It's health information that I need to talk to him. Once I talk to him, 
If he let me, I need to talk to you too. And sometimes they accept. Other times they don't accept. And I just try to get most information from them. So I feel sometimes like a CSI. <laughs> because practically, when the patients came, oh, well, I had sex, well, because uh, that's something that I love from my job, always we are talking about sex. When they, yeah, when they came to, the, to our clinic, okay, with who you had sex during the last six months? Uh, with four, okay. From those four, with how many were male, how many female? And we go in detail for, on each one. Okay, the first one, what's his name? No, Raul, okay, Raul what? Well, I don't know, where do you met him? Uh, at the bar, what bar? Okay, he's over here. Do you know phone number? No. Do you know what he drives? No. Okay, let's pretend that he owes you $100,000. How do you find him? Oh, well, uh, I met him at his apartment. Okay, where, where is that apartment? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> okay, guide me through how I can get there. And they goes, okay, go 31 by Rigsby, and then turns there is an apartment, second floor, the, the door, the second door, the right, that's where he is. Okay, how he looks like, because I don't want to tell Raul's father, which <laughs> happens also names is Raul, to tell you. <laughs> so all that was, that's what we do in a single day, daily basis. Right now, this morning, I, I just saw a guy who send, uh, we received that person from some out from, from Bear County. It came from region, I don't know, from the north of Texas, Amarillo, let me say. And uh, the information that I received is, is a young boy, 17 years old, Mr. John, and uh, he was partner. Partner is somebody who has sex with another person, and we know that other person had syphilis. This case was syphilis. Uh, so we look for Mr. John at that age, more or less. He only knew about what street he lives. So we have the sources to look into that program. We look for the street, how many Mr. Jones lives at that particular age. Well, three matches. OK. Well, on the description, because we ask everything, they say that they have tattoos all over the body. All right, so this morning I went, I knocked in three different, in the three different doors. Uh, it, it, it was under 18, so right now they are already in the house because they don't have classes. So the first one, it was nothing. The other one, it was not there. The third one, there you go. It was skinny, it was shaved, a lot of tattoos. John, yes? <laughs> I need to talk to you. Okay, well, I drew the blood. Because besides all that, you need to be able to draw blood, okay? And in any situation, it could be in the sidewalk, in the car, in the parking lot, in the house, dark, you have to be able to do that. So yes, I took the blood. I just, coming from, from the, the health department, I sent the blood up. I got the result because we got the results in one hour. Guess what? Yes, he was positive. Right away, because at the moment I took the blood, okay, I got the, the, the information from him. Mr. John, oh yes, Mr. Gonzalez, yes. Well, have you ever had syphilis? No, well, now you do. <laughs> you need to come to get treated. <laughs> oh, okay, don't tell me. Who was the one who told you? Well, you know what, I cannot tell you. Yeah. Just be prepared because what we're going to ask you once you come to our clinic, I cannot take the treatment to you. You need to come now to the clinic to get treated. Just be prepared. When you come over here to the clinic, we're going to ask you with who you've been sexually active during the last year. Okay? And yes, okay, well, the same way that we are protecting the information from the other person, we're going to protect your information. So that's why. And that was an easy one. That was an easy one. There are too many uh, that they know already what is going on. We find, we find that the homosexual uh, community here in San Antonio is too tight. They have their own ways to communicate between each other. 
Sometimes they know what is going on about their HIV status. They just don't care. Other ones are more responsible, and they gave us the names. Uh, we tried to get the whole information. Actually, we tried to get as much information about the partners to be tested and being treated. Sometimes we already know who is going to be positive in the next two months. Why? Because that person, once he tells us all the information, we have the database from all over Barrow County, so we know who is positive and who is negative. Unfortunately, we cannot tell him, hey, from the five partners that you gave me, four are HIV positive. It's just a matter of, of time that you came positive. The only thing that we can do is tell him, you know what? Right now you are negative. In the next two months, I need to see you here again for a new test because you were playing with fire. And right now is your HIV negative, but it's no guarantee that in the next two months you're gonna still negative. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't get it, and they still playing really bad. So yes, it's a hard, it's a hard work that we do every single day. Uh, it's not just for HIV, it's for syphilis, it's for chlamydia, it's for gonorrhea. Uh, when syphilis goes up, we know HIV goes up. Okay, syphilis is an open door for the infection. Patients with syphilis have uh, two chances easier for them to catch the HIV virus than persons who don't have syphilis. Um, but yes, it's a hard labor that we do every single day. Many people from outside and, and the community, they don't know about us. They just said, I didn't know that you come over here. Are you the sex police? <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> kind of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and the sexy police. The sexy police, well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So yes, we are at the first step. We are, we are at the first step of the old channel when the HIV is going on in the city. Um, it's a hard labor again. I would like to have more people doing the prevention for, for the HIV, making aware that what is going on in the community. Uh, but still, I, I, was, I was talking with somebody and what would you do if somebody, strange, totally stranger, okay, I'm up here in front of your house, knock the door, nice to meet you, my name is Mr. Gonzalez, uh, I'm looking for Mr. George, okay, I'm Mr. Jo Mr. George, uh, I have the information, I come from Metro Health, I have the information that you might be exposed to HIV or syphilis. Of course, everything is confidential, and before I tell that information to you, I was already see if nobody else is listening. What would you say? How, what do you think about it? Sometimes I, I, I put in the shoes on the person that I'm interviewing. Well, they are right. Who, what the hell are you? What are you doing in my home? Right? Well, yes, it's something that we do. And I just uh, would like to remember every time that we try to look for help, when we find that person and we try to send them uh, uh, to get services, well, sometimes it costs a lot of field visits, try to find him, try to get the test on, try to, okay, identify him, and then when I try to send, refer him to any place for get services, well, I have an appointment next two weeks, next one week, or, or um, actually right now I don't have any complaints with nobody, okay, I just <laughs> want to be sure. <laughs> but, uh, it's hard labor to get those patients and convince them to get received the proper care. It's hard to help somebody who doesn't need, doesn't want to be helped. Okay, uh, so that's what we do <laughs> in a daily basis. I don't know if you have any comment, any questions, complaints with her. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> See, um, Gabe talked a little bit about this morning about what is, uh, kind of initiatives are you guys doing now you know, within um, DIS, in particular, you were going to mention, uh, I think, in addressing the cultural aspects of who's getting
getting infected around that. You had some thoughts about women. And the other one was um, why the rapes. And another one was about the use of social media. So I think there were three kind of thoughts that were running around. Do you want to oh, respond yeah. to any or all of them? Okay. With the, my question, when Dr. Mengler was talking about um, the women, there is the access to care and women are finding it more difficult uh, to get the care that they need. And then my personal thought, and having done this for so many years, is that if you have a woman that is of lower economical status, and there is a man providing any percentage of care for her and her children, she is not going to deny him access to her. When he wants to have sex with her, she's going to have sex because there could be a consequence of, I won't pay the light bill if you don't. And then if he's on, there's that other, that down low factor. So if he's secretly having sex with men or he's going to the bathhouse or whatever other activities he has going on, then there's, there goes the risk for that woman. That could be her only partner, but not necessarily he is. For that reason, I think you have older men sleeping with younger women, and then the other way around, and then it's still that, that down low factor, the men that don't consider themselves to be gay, MSM, um, and they have families at home, they have long-term girlfriends or wives or whatever have you. Um, there's increase, we see a lot with the sex workers, and San Antonio, as you all probably know, has a huge drug issue. Um, methamphetamine, we get so many coming through our clinics and my question, I don't get to interact with the patients very often, but when I do, I know there's a distinct purpose. And so I always go in and it's kind of hard. What's in your heart is what comes out of your mouth. And um, I'm just going to say it. I love the Lord. So when I approach it, it's from a whole nother level and perspective. And I always try to meet the need. I'm, I'm wanting to find out what can I do for you? What are you prepared to do? What are you willing to do? And what are you crying out for? Because I'm sitting here. Um, I'll give an example in particular. There was a young lady and she did not want to receive treatment for syphilis. And she wasn't allergic to penicillin, so our thought was, it's been very difficult to get her, we need to bicker. Bic is bicillin, which is what we give for syphilis. And she didn't want these shots. So I was trying to get an understanding of why her heart was so hard, because there was just such a strong resistance there. And one of the things she said, I've been up for three days. So I, I knew why she had been up for three days, but I wanted her to tell me why she had been up for three days so then I could find a door in to try and address the other issue that I could clearly see was going on. Well, I've been smoking meth for, for three days. So I wanted her to tell me more about that addiction. And when we got right down to it, she, her heart was so hard, but at the end of that conversation, she was crying because I was able to penetrate that place of, of need. She just really, I don't know that anybody had ever told her I love you or I want to help you. I don't really know that she'd ever heard any of those things, but in that moment, I just wanted to be that person to say, okay, yes, we need to treat this syphilis, but tell me what else can I do for you? What do you need from me? Who can I call? What other help can I get you? And then first finding out, and I don't share this very often, but I'm the daughter of an addict. So I understand that that whole piece, having gone through the Al-Anon, and I wasn't the one that could sit there and say, oh yes, I'm the daughter of an addict and this is what I need. That just wasn't her, okay? Me, that wasn't her. So I do understand that whole piece, and I needed to know from her, how can I help you? What do you want me to do? And when it was all said and done, she really was tired. Because that's the first thing you got to find out when you're dealing with addiction. Are you tired? Because you cannot help someone that's addicted to something that does not want to be helped. It's a waste of your time. And so she really did. And her grandmother was there and there were some other things. So I was able to, to help her. But these people are young um, and they're heroin addicts. And as long as I've been doing this, I'm still blown away, but I still cry. I guess I'm a wuss, I have a, I'm very sensitive. So when I 
see this and I'm thinking, I'm 39 years old as of last Sunday, yay me. But they're, <laughs> they're like 16 and 15 and they have track marks and sometimes I leave the room to go cry so that I can come back and be able to really fully address it. But I got to go get that out first because I'm sad that, you know, this is their life and this is what's happening to them. What was the other? I talked so much. What was no, I, I, I think another element with that that we don't admit to in San Antonio is human trafficking. Yes. And that that's <clears throat> not a choice of some people. And I do know you can literally track sometimes those that have been with the uh, coyote who brings them across and then mm -hmm. abandons them mm -hmm. and they've been raped along the way and so they feel like garbage or throwaways yeah. once they get here having no resources of where to go and so prostitution is one of the places that they go and people say sex workers as if that in all instances is by choice. And for a lot of women, in particular in San Antonio, given our very high poverty rate and given the immigration and the human trafficking that's happening now, it is not. And given their age. Yeah. Yes, that is going on. And then the social networking. What are you doing on that? Yes. We are trying. It's very hard at, at Metro Health, but we are trying with the city manager and our program manager to get handles, names on the different uh, websites, the Adam for Adam, just all the different ones that um, men are frequenting and trying to, we go in as normal, not as Metro Health, but when we're trying to find someone, we'll log in and maybe the OP, which is the original patient, gave us the P1's name, which is the partner, and then we go in and we try to have a conversation with that person online. It's, kind of, it's very difficult because they have all these, they've got to come up with a way to do the firewalls, and so I don't think any of us are just trying to go and, and hang out on the site, but it benefits <laughs> us to be able to go in and find the people that we're trying to find. And then the InSpot, some of you may be familiar with InSpot, but InSpot is a tool that we can use to send email messages uh, to partners, and they actually have their own little um, logos and pictures. You can kind of pick one that you want to use, or you can design one yourself, but you send a message, and because it's so catchy when it comes through, people have a tendency to open it and read it for that reason, because it can be colorful, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's sexy. It is, like, like her, yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> but in any event, they read them, and then it prompts them to call. And then we can start that conversation and possibly get them in for, for uh, testing and our treatment, or we can send one of the DIS to do what we call a field blood. Are there any questions for DIS? Everything you wanted to know about sex but were afraid to ask in San Antonio Underground, right? Okay, yes, sure. Grinder, grinder. Okay. And what about Jack? Jack. Mo I said yeah. Jack. And and Moco and Moco Space. Moco Space. Moco Space. Mhm. Mm the kids use that one a lot. Yeah, they use that one a lot. What about Adam for Adam? Grinder. Those are all social all media places. We're very familiar with them because every time that we talk to the patient, we, where did you mess them? There you go. Grinder. Grinder is an application on the phone that mm -hmm. tells you who other persons are nearby you. Pretty much what you do. Uh, and then you have to say, hey, uh, I feel, I'm sorry, the word, but I feel horny. Do you want something? Oh, yeah, I need you. They got the station on there. And they go. Jack is the new one. Now they are uh, moving from Grinder to Jack. Uh, yes. I have a question. When, you, when you're coming across people in the field that are maybe their partners in that way, are they less likely to have identified the information of other partners? That's something you're finding? Or? That's why we want to have access to those applications. Yeah. Because those are, I mean, free applications. Yeah. Uh, it's like, even Facebook, even Facebook. Use the mic, he said. Oh. Name. 
Yes, we, we asked for the, the um, how do you call it? Not the nickname, for the, the screen. The screen name or the username. The screen name or the username. Mm -hmm. and, and that way, well, we have one, one access to Houston. We need to triangle the information. Well, we have this, this screen name. We send it to Houston, and after 24 or 48 hours, they send us back because I think they, they can send an email or contact, but we personally, we cannot do it. We don't have the power to do it. And even Grindr uh, and the other applications, we, we have no access. Sometimes, and it happened to me that they, even the patient, when they saw, oh, I have sex with, well, this is the picture, and they saw it to me. Let me bring up, they bring up Facebook or, or yeah, maybe most of the time Facebook, and I saw him, hey, that happened, that, that guy I saw him in the clinic last week. Okay, so well, it's one person less that I have to, but now that person didn't give me the name of the, per the person that was here, so something is wrong. And then they so, yeah. talk about policy. One of the policies around is the access that health departments or city and county systems need in order to be able to look at, and this is gonna sound funny, play with or play around with those kinds of social, they're, past, they're popping up almost faster than we can keep up, but because of anti-pornographic um, policies at um, universities, city and county governments, it can be an impediment for the specialty that is needed at this level. And that's a policy issue that we need to get around, but sometimes it takes us so long to get around it, how many other, how many other young people have gotten infected by the time we can get a policy done. I wanna move on to um, our own program, which I am the program manager for, run by Bear County Department of Community Resources and our Division of Community Health, and introduce our HIV planner, uh, Allison Elmer. She just recently got married, and so I forget her always to call her uh, by her other last name, and it's Bayla, and so she's going to do her presentation. Here you go, Allison. Got it up? Can you open it up? It's a free will. It has to be a free will. Even though I hear don't listen to me, but when they have a, when they have a, a meeting somewhere else, when all the BIAs from all over the, the United States are right, they told me from English, every state has their own law. So, but in Louisiana, they told me if a patient, like you said, you know what, we know that a person has to be, well, First, we need to assess all the way to bring that person in the clinic. The second step, 
I can take a police officer and make him come to get treatment. So everybody, you can have a state with this. That's what I can do in Seattle. I bet it's that way in Nevada. Some clinics, and this is what we're trying to move towards, we're trying to get a mobile unit. Um, Take the mic, we just second record. We're trying to get a mobile unit. Um, there's one, Dallas has one. I actually came from Dallas. And what I can say about that mobile unit is it works so well in attracting people. Um, people would call in and ask, where's the mobile van? Because they could easily access it rather than coming to, to the clinic. And so when you have a one-stop shop, and that's one thing, one of the things that we have working against us, and we are working diligently to try to get this changed, we don't have anyone that can treat in the field. So when you find a crack addict, a heroin addict, or someone that does not dance to our music, I can tell you to come see me at three, you'll be there. I tell them to come see me at three, it might be three next week. It just doesn't work like that. And so we need a one-stop shop. We need to be able to treat them when we find them. The other thing we don't have is the ability to transport. Our DIS use the city vehicles, but they cannot transport in them. So when we find these individuals, so that's two things working against us. We can't treat them, nor can we transport them. So I'm relatively new here, um, haven't been here a year yet. And these are just some of the things that I've identified, and I'm working really hard to try and, and get those things changed. Otherwise, the syphilis outbreak that we're in the middle of, I won't be able to get a handle on it. We, and that's what we need everyone's help with this thing. This has been the toughest of my career so far because I'm asked a lot of questions that I just don't have answers for because I have, from what I know and my experience, I have these things working against us. And so for some of you, these are things you need to advocate for. The budgets for these things and the policies to change for these things. And that starts with awareness. And even though this is a small group, now all of you know two things that she needs and what her wish list is in order to get the syphilis epidemic down. Okay, Allison. So what I'm gonna talk about today is how clients receive services after they've been identified. Um, because a lot of clients who are tested HIV positive don't have health insurance and don't have other means to get treatment and uh, services. Uh, these are some of our topics that we're gonna go over briefly. Next slide. So I work for Bear County as the Charlene. Uh, we're known as the administrative agency or the grantee uh, for Ryan White funds. Uh, we have Ryan White funds parts A and B, and we'll differentiate the parts in just a second. Uh, we contract with agencies to provide services. In your packet, uh, later on in the presentation, you'll see all the agencies that we contract with. Uh, we must monitor services to make sure that they're of high quality. Uh, we also have to write grants to maintain the service system. Uh, we, our biggest grant is from the federal government, and it's about $4 million. Uh, so we have to write grants each year to get that money. Uh, we also have to provide training, and I am the HIV planner. Uh, there's usually two of us, but there's only one right now. Uh, and what I do is identify needs, gaps in services, and barriers to care. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see, this is our service area. It's the whole Region 8, so it goes from Eagle Pass, Texas, to Victoria, it's, well, actually beyond Victoria, Texas. So there's 28 counties in our service area. Uh, those are listed alphabetically, not by uh, region. We actually have three regions, uh, the Uvalde area, the San Antonio area, and Victoria area. Uh, obvious, well, uh, so the San Antonio area has by far the most HIV cases, probably close to 5,000 uh, in our area. Victoria is the next with about 140 cases, and then Eagle Pass has 96 cases or so. Uh, Eagle Pass has actually had a fairly substantial increase in uh, a, uh, the number of diagnosed. Uh, Victoria has been kind of stable, but they keep getting people who move to Victoria just out of the blue from different places. And then San Antonio has had a very large increase in the number of newly diagnosed in the last couple of years. Uh, the ones bolded are 
Bear Comel, Guadalupe, and Wilson, and those are eligible for Ryan White Part A funding. Everybody else is eligible for Ryan White Part B funding, and we'll kind of touch on the differences in a second. So next slide, please. Um, as you can all see, we have these HIV210.org. Uh, the colors on the slide, we're missing red, so my whole presentation's in red. Uh, uh, as you can see, HIV210.org is a website that is sponsored by the San Antonio Planning Council. Uh, the Planning Council is a planning body that comes together. It can be up to 30 people. Right now it's like 20 or 21, and they're all defined positions. So we have people who are substance abuse providers, mental health providers, people living with HIV. Uh, a third of our uh, planning council has to be people living with HIV. And this board was established in 94, and what they do is they help determine what services are needed in the area. Uh, so they do needs assessments, like right now we're doing a needs assessment for mental health, and then we're going to do one for substance abuse. Uh, they also set the allocations. Uh, so they decide, well, this year uh, pharmacy is like really important because there's all these new medicines and medicines are very expensive and we have all these people coming into care. We need to fund it at a higher percentage than we did last year. Uh, same with medical care. Or, you know, the food bank's gotten really big lately. We don't need to fund food as much as we used to. So that's what the planning council does. Does that make sense? Basically? Okay. So, I would like for y'all to check this out sometime. HIV210.org is the website of the Planning Council. And the cool thing about the website is it has an interactive resource guide. So that red resource guide is actually on the website. Uh, and there's like about HIV. And there's also vignettes or videos of people who have HIV or doctors uh, talking about HIV. And we're doing it to get the word out more and destigmatize. Uh, HIV, so it's it's not as taboo. So people are on there talking about how they were infected or what it means to live with HIV. And also, if you get if you want to, all of our needs assessments are on the website, and all of our minutes and everything like that are on the website. And also, it shows where the free HIV testing is. And it's also bilingual. Yes. Uh, has everybody heard of Ryan White? Okay, so we don't need to go there. Uh, so the Ryan White program is a federal, federally funded program that provides uh, treatment and care services for people who are HIV positive. It is the largest disease specific program in the United States. However, it is not the largest payer for people who have HIV. Medicaid and Medicare are. Uh, however, uh, the Ryan White program receives about $2 billion a year from the federal government. And that covers every single state in the union and um, all, the nat all the territories, like the Virgin Islands and Guam and Puerto Rico and what have you. Uh, and the District of Columbia receive, part, uh, receive Ryan White funds. As I was mentioning earlier, the Ryan White legislation is uh, broken into five different parts. Part A, Part B, Part C, Part D, and Part F. There is no Part E. There was, but it was never funded, so it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, part federal government didn't know how to do the alphabet. No, part part E or what would have been part E was actually for occupational exposure, but it was never funded. Uh, part A is for areas that are hard hit by the epidemic, so Dallas, Houston, Fort Fort Worth, San Antonio, uh, Washington D.C., New York. There's quite a few areas that receive Part A funding. Part B funding is the funding for all the medications um, through the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, and also for every state in the union and the territories receive Part B funding. The Part B is actually the largest part of the Ryan White program by far. Part C, which is what Central Med receives, is for early intervention services and other outpatient medical care. They can do medical nutrition, case management. There's a number of things they can do under Part C. Part D is for women, infants, children, and youth. Uh, and they started out as a demonstration project and were the ones who were able to help reduce the transmission between mother and child. And now it's like very, very small. And then Part F is kind of like a whole big training program. It's, they do uh, dental training. They do uh, 
AIDS education training centers. They'll come, you know, with that funding they go out and not the federal government themselves, but uh, different organizations go out and do trainings about HIV. So that's what Part F is. Uh, if you want to learn more about Ryan White and the Ryan White program, you can go to hab.hrsa.gov and you can actually look at the timeline and everything. So, next. As uh, we haven't mentioned yet, uh, it was started in 1990 and uh, has been reauthorized a number of times and now we're in 2000, well, actually we're in 2013, so it was reauthorized in 2009 as the Ryan White HIV Treatment Extension Act. And what was going on in 2009 is the federal government said, hey, we have good treatment, we need to find people early. Because back in 2009, they estimated 21% of people came into care late, or came in, did not know their HIV status. And the, they said, you know, with all this treatment, it, that it's not as effective once someone's had HIV for many, many years, so it's much better to find someone early. That's where you get the routine testing because the idea that people are going, you know, to the doctor or the emergency room and getting HIV tested there is a lot better than, you know, when they're in the emergency room for an opportunistic infection 10 years down the road. So that's where we're at now. Um, so the federal government likes acronyms. This is called the Early Identification of Individuals with HIV or AIDS, also known as EHA. Uh, and this is mandated by the federal government in the Ryan White legislation. And we are required to link with other agencies that provide testing to ensure people are being tested for HIV. Uh, the Ryan White program pays for a very, very little amount of testing. Uh, because we're not really supposed to. Uh, that is why we have to link with other agencies in order to provide testing. Uh, and the idea is, you know, once we link with them, they can uh, link people into care and get people into care quicker and make sure that they follow them and ensure that they are in care. Um, so, as I said, the 21% is actually uh, closer to 18%, so we have made a, a difference in finding people earlier, so more people are aware of their HIV status now than they were. Any questions? No? Okay. So, um, very briefly, the eligibility for Ryan White will vary from area to area. What I'm going to talk about is for our area. So if you have clients who came from Houston and said, hey, they provided this service in Houston and I could be up to 500% of the poverty level, I don't know if that's true, uh, why, why can't you do that here? Because the Ryan White program is very unique in that we can make our own eligibility rules as long as people are HIV positive and of low income. So we define what low income means. The planning council does. Uh, so you have to be HIV positive to be Ryan White uh, eligible or related or affected to someone who is HIV positive. Uh, some services can be provided to you. Also for financial, clients must be at or below 300% of the federal poverty level, except for the categories of case management where you could be of any level. Uh, but we don't really see a lot of millionaires coming into the clinics getting case management. So uh, They could. They could. Uh, residency, clients must live in one of the 28 counties to receive services. Uh, and Ryan White must be the payer of last resort. So if a person has Medicaid or Medicare, it's expected that you would charge Medicaid or Medicare for those services and not Ryan White. Uh, however, if a person is veter a veteran and VA eligible, you do not have to make that person go to the VA because of different um, discriminations uh, at the VA over time with the, like, the don't ask, don't tell and everything. Um, they are allowed to receive services at the fax clinic or at Centromed, uh, even though that they would be eligible at the VA. That's the only exception. Between six 
and 800 in the South Texas area. So literally, they, since they aren't um, reported to Metro Health, we in the Ryan White could literally have a flood of clients come in and say, I want Ryan White care because I don't want to go to the VA and we would be obliged to take care of it. Hello? Yeah. Okay, I fixed it. Okay, uh, so we actually fund six agencies uh, in our 28 county area. The Alamo Area Resource Center, uh, which is in San Antonio, that's their, t that's their uh, front desk number. Uh, Centro Med, uh, the San Antonio uh, Santa Rosa Clinic in San Antonio, and also the uh, San Antonio Street Clinic in New Braunfels. The New Braunfels Clinic only provides services on Tuesdays, uh, but they're looking on Tuesdays as of right now. Uh, the San Antonio AIDS Foundation, uh, University Health Systems, the FACTS Clinic, uh, Victoria City County Health Department, which is in Victoria, Texas, and the Maverick County Hospital District, which is in Eagle Pass. Uh, those are all of our service providers. Um, as a note, all HIV positive clients can self-refer to care. So you could give this number, any of these numbers to a client and they would be able to self-refer to care. Uh, but they do need to bring the following, proof of po HIV positivity, proof of income, some sort of ID, a social security card. However, services will not be denied to anybody who is not, who is, uh, not a legal resident, and also proof of insurance if they are insured. So um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but in your packet, which is in your portfolio thingy, that thing. Uh, it lists all the service categories that we fund and where you can access those services. So like outpatient ambulatory medical care, I have a description of what it is. It's primary medical care in an outpatient setting. Uh, one thing I didn't discuss earlier is we, we don't pay for, we cannot pay for hospitalization. Legislatively, we would be in a lot of trouble if we started pay, paying for people's hospitalization. The whole point of the Ryan White program is to keep people out of the hospital. So uh, outpatient ambulatory medical care is provided at UHS Central, uh, Victoria, <clears throat> and Maverick County. And so you can see all of the services that we provide. And not all services are provided in all areas, uh, like Victoria. Substance abuse is not provided because we don't have, a, with the limited allocation of funding for that area, we don't have enough money to pay for some of those types of services. Uh, and uh, like mental health services, um, psychiatric services aren't provided in the rural areas because it's hard to find a rural provider for psychiatric services um, and what have you. So that's, that's that. Any questions on the Ryan White program? We're going to have a pop quiz in about two minutes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Alice. I appreciate that. Well, one of the categories that she had up there was early intervention services. And so we provide, remember that initiative that she said was the EHA initiative? That's that early identification. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we did in San Antonio in order to support that initiative was fund a provider, and it was the Alamo Area Resource Center, to do our early intervention. 
And that was done competitively bid. And they not only wrote a proposal, they wrote a proposal that knocked everybody's socks off and developed a model program for early intervention that has now become a best practices program in the United States. So I'm going to uh, introduce Jesus Ortega from the Alamo Area Resource Center to talk with you and describe a little bit about their early intervention program and how they link clients to care. Where is he? Over there. Technical problems. All right. Uh, my name is Jesus Ortega, and I'm the programs manager right now at the Alamo Area Resource Center. I've been with ARC um, five months, uh, actually, as tomorrow, <laughs> six months tomorrow. Um, so, as Charlene was saying, part of um, part of what we do as the early intervention um, services, um, I have to say that even before that, I do think that um, in what we've been hearing today, in order for us to really implement this program, it is very important to have partnership and collaboration within the community. We won't, we won't be able to do this program, and right now we've been presenting even nationally because it have, uh, has really impact in the clients that we work with, but we won't be able to do that if we don't work closely with the county as the administrator agency, with FACS, actually clinic, to provide extra referrals and clear um, partnership with them. To, because um, before I understand it was even better because they were on the second floor and we were on the third floor and we can just go you know, up and down. Now we have to cross, go across the street in order to get that. Um, but if it's, if it's about partnership and collaboration that can make this implementation of this program really successful and effective among the different agencies. Um, and in regard to testing, which I think that um, I want to mention something that is very important. Uh, in the last, one of the things that um, we have also some programs from DISHES in terms of doing prevention and testing, and we're actually working very closely with Walgreens for HIV testing, uh, National Testing Week on the 27, 28, and 29. And, um, and again, it's about partnership and collaboration. And we won't be able to do that if we don't engage in those kind of collaborations. And uh, one of the things that struck me about San Antonio, um, as you guys can see, I'm not from here. I'm actually from Venezuela. And it's how we can make routine testing a routine. <laughs> and that's a challenge. Um, we were trying to actually get to do HIV testing at the Pride event. And it's been quite a challenge. We have to create a coalition. We've been working very closely to them. And we have to be approved in order to be able to do that in a gay pride event in which testing is still a stigma. So, um, so, so testing in itself has a lot of challenge. And the EIS is, OK, when these people are actually diagnosed as being positive, what it is that we can do to link them immediately to care? So um, you may, and I want to go through very quick. Um, this is the people that should be here. This is a present, uh, but this is just me right now. And actually, at the time, I was the director of EIS, which is the Early Intervention Services. But you know, life has some changes within the agency, and now I'm the director of the programs manager. But this is, in general, the Alamo Resource Center. Um, we expanded in 2012 our EIS to include testing also in non-traditional locations, such as park, libraries, churches, parole, um, boards, colleges, and university. And um, this is a little bit of the history of how this program has actually evolved within, even within the agency. And, um, and now one of the things that we are doing, um, because we, uh, we're really trying to reach the hardest to reach population. And it's interesting that you guys mentioned about Grindr and about Manhunter and about Adams to Adams and all of that. One of the things that we're trying to do is really how we can 
tap into that. And one of the things that is happening is that they actually those website takes you down if you start talking too much about HIV prevention. They take your profile. So one of the things that we're trying to figure out and creating policies internally is that some of the workers, the outreach works that we have, how they can actually participate in that conversation, right? So, um, but you know, it's the issue of what picture do you put? Uh, do you put your own picture? Do you put somebody else's? And um, so outreach is a big part of EIS. It's how do we go about testing, where do we go? We actually have like, um, you call mobile testing, we have, um, in which we go to the park, we actually go like three times a week to the different parts in San Antonio where people actually hook up. And, um, but definitely social media is the biggest place for hook up right now. And we have to figure out how to do it. We're thinking about the idea of young people actually being peers to, to be able to themselves be talking to other people, but you know, there is a lot of training that has to go with that and there is a lot of like, you know, establish boundaries so that they can actually do it themselves. Um, so the goal of EIS in particular is definitely to facilitate early access to medical care and remove the barriers to ensure medical adherence. And some of the activities that we have, we have an initial intake and assessment, uh, case management, referrals, um, employment for all the entitlement program benefits, and then targeted outreach, um, as I mentioned before, and particular conventional site for HIV testing and counseling. Um, we're actually trying to get right now into um, those um, pole dance um, strip clubs, and particularly to target women. And um, it's been a little bit of a challenge However, it seems like we want to have an open door at least for one, to do it as long as before the hours, before they start working, if we can actually go and do some of the testing to the women. And also one of the things that we've been doing is um, day labor testing. So we're going to the streets and actually trying to test day, um, day workers. One of the things that is happening is that day workers are actually being used as sex workers. They're being picked up, and instead of doing day work, like carpentry or anything like that, they're actually being used as sex workers. Um, so that's one of the things that we also targeting in testing. <clears throat> um, this is a lot of a specific about the program, and I don't wanna go over everything, but this is intense. We have an initial intake. And from that, we moved that into case management. And the case management is also very intense, intense case management. We do a curious scale. We assess client medical and psychosocial history, and develop a service plan. And then we try to implement that service plan in a timely manner. Sometimes we say three months. That's the goal. However, um, working with the client sometimes to keep them into medical adherence is a challenge itself because of all the barriers. Um, so we do referrals to access HIV and medical care, and we also apply for entitlement benefits. We can move this a little bit along. Um, we go to local bars, streets, um, and then we do the counseling as well in, with for HIV testing. <clears throat> and I guess that one of the things that it's very particular about the EIS program that we have is that they have four main components. And one is they have to make a first medical appointment. And we try to make sure that they do that. Uh, they will also have to get an appointment for a mental health and substance abuse assessment and services. They receive also health education and risk reduction class and also a nutrition assessment that we work very closely with the FACTS clinic to actually do that. And um, so those are what we call the milestone. They need to complete this in order to move either to medical case management or non-medical case management within the agency. One of the things that I think that is good about the Alamoeda Resource Center um, what I call my attention when I start applying for this job is that we have this model of one stop. 
service. So people can, um, and I think you were referring to that, right? We do have health insurance, we do have housing, we do have mental health and substance abuse. We actually do have also patient navigators that help actually the clients to navigate the system so that they can be a medical adherence, a medication adherence. Um, we also um, have, um, it's a project that is um, part of the um, UT uh, Health Science Center that we're collaborating. And it's kind of like a national significant project which is called the Women's Heart Project. And, um, and this is just a specific for women to provide, who are HIV positive, to provide them and follow up with them throughout many years to see what are the barriers to care and to health and dealing with the issue of HIV. Um, so we track with primary medical care infection disease, which are Centromed and FACS. Um, we try to figure it out in terms of the milestone um, when they do the first medical appointment, which includes lab work and meeting with a medical social worker. And the second medical appointment is scheduled within two weeks of the first appointment and is group obtaining the lab and the medication therapy if needed. <clears throat> um, so again, uh, when one of the things that we're trying to do within the EIS program is um, really to find out what are the needs of the client, what are the barriers. We do a very exhaustive assessment and trying to figure out how we can make referrals that can help the client to really overcome the barriers to medical adherence. And um, we, I mean, again, we do medical history, psychological symptoms, household dynamics, and system use. Um, <clears throat> And then we also have what we call the PTA. And we found that this has been very helpful for the clients, which is kind of like the peer treatment advocacy. And they do a lot of the education uh, to learn about HIV, to learn about this risk, um, to learn about what kind of behaviors um, can put them in dangerous. Um, we do also, you know, HIV uh, one-on-one, medication adherence, and um, and they do have some kind of like pre and post tests before the milestone and after the milestone. So one of the things sometimes is that we lose, um, sometimes we lose them <laughs> and we need to keep track of them. And that's a big part, important part of the EIS. We use Facebook, we use all the outreach workers have cell phones and they participate on Facebook and it's incredible. The either texting of Facebook is the way that the clients reach us. And sometimes uh, if we make a phone call, a uh, home visit, um, they even say like, uh, why you didn't text me? <laughs> so I think that one of the things, if we also have to become innovative about how we do our reach and how people wanna be actually contacted. And Facebook is definitely one way that we do it. They sometimes talk more on Facebook than even when they are on one-on-one, -on -one, particularly with the young people. Um, and they'll, um, they can actually, even if they move into medical case management, they still can use the PTA program. And we have actually most of the, actually all the PTAs are bilingual within ARC. And we also have women's, if they prefer to have women PTAs. <clears throat> And then, as I say, we also refer people to Center Med and Facts for the dietitian. And this is something that people have found very helpful um, to have even like this idea that I have a nutrition plan for myself and how that affects my health. And, um, and evidently, it's, it's something that is part of their, um, you know, understanding how they can actually really be healthier and, um, and what is the impact that all of that has within their immune system and how they can help in terms of the type of medication that they take. Um, clients are actually tracked up to six months uh, post-transition for medical adherence. And one of the things, in order to be eligible for EIS, and I should have mentioned that before, is that you have to be newly diagnosed, newly diagnosed for HIV, 
and all you have to be out of care for more than six months. So um, those two people are the one that we particularly target. <clears throat> So that's kind of like a general um, way that how EIS work. We get actually um, referrals for you know hospital, healthcare, aid services organization, testing sites, and um, and then they we do the initial intake, and then we see either newly diagnosed or out of care, and we do the case management. And these are here are the four milestones. And, um, and then we actually staff them with the PCM. And if we either transfer to medical case management or no medical case management, um, but they, can, they could be in the program sometimes for up to a year. Uh, sometimes people do the, um, they want to stay within EIS because they felt it that EIS helped them in that process, particularly the newly diagnosed. But we also kind of trying to uh, reach for, you know, um, self-determination and self-sufficiency. And that's the idea. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, but if they actually relapse and they go out of medical adherence, we can actually go back to EIS. So this is just to give you a little bit of um, who are the people who participate in EIS. 65% um, are Hispanic and 20.72% are African American, uh, which is up to 85% of the population that we serve. Um, and then in terms of gender, um, we have um, and the colors are kind of funny here because this seems to be the same. You can feel that this is transgender, but this is actually males. And, um, and we, have, we do have a very small percentage of transgender population here. And that's definitely the age. Most of the people is between 25 and 44 years old. Um, 429 clients. And, uh, and this is actually for 2012. <clears throat> And we have um, returning to care are actually 40% of the people that we have within EIS, and actually 60% are newly diagnosed. And we have 742 positive individuals that came throughout the program last year. Um, again, this is a little bit of a... Uh, the number of people who, of the positive, uh, who has AIDS. <clears throat> and some of them are HIV. No, 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 we, we can. So one of the thing about the EIS, out of the 742 clients that we have in the program, 532 completed a milestone. And evidently, this is, has to do with a lot of the intensive case management that we do at the beginning, and also the collaboration with the different agencies, so that we can really track that person. Uh, working very closely with FAT and Max Clinic. Um, and again, when we refer them to our reach, which is at around 47%, um, what, it, what it, we means by refer by our reach is when they actually fell out of medical adherence, we have an outreach specialty position. And that person go after that. Um, and try by any means, home visits, Facebook, um, any website that the person has, just trying to find that person to bring them back into services. And we have just 16% of them that actually refuse. Um, and this 10% is people who are incarcerated, 10 of them who are actually incarcerated, that that's what we have to drop them out of services. And this is the CD4 count for them. And it seems that most of the people um, is their CD4 counts are between 350 and 499 as a result of, uh, so it's also not only the medical adherence, but also how their treatment have improved their health and the CD4 counts for them. 
I only have 10 minutes, that's what it was? <laughs> okay. Um, this is the number of clients according to the viral low, and, and if you see, most of the clients, their viral loads is zero to 50. So it's very low. I guess that part of what, since EIS is really is about medical adherence, 83% of the people who participate in the program stay under medical adherence. Um, and those who are non-compliant, uh, even though it's small, we still try to do the outreach part of the program. So one of the big thing that we also do is, uh, is our marketing plan, which is something that is very innovative about the EIS. Uh, we have used both shelter, junior posters, advertising in local publication, we participate in awareness day, and we also try to do something that is more targeted, right? Um, we try to look for the zip codes of newly diagnosed in the past three years, zip codes of loss of care population, loss to care population, and we demographic of the target population. And you guys saw African Americans and Latinos are the higher proportion of this population. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is our marketing plan and how it has evolved uh, so far. And this is one of our um, samples. We did it in Spanish and English, and we have billboards, and we also have it on the bus. And you can show the other ones. That's the bus shelter, this is the junior posters. And our program is called Thrive. Um, the EIS program is called Thrive. And most of the targeted, we target in these areas here, on the zip codes of San Antonio, on the east and the west side. Um, so some of the success can be as definitely uh, attributed to the intensive case management, the fact that the outreach is actually targeted, uh, the cooperation between the different agencies that we work with, the program design, the peer treatment advocate program, the marketing campaign, and, um, and I think it's also, you know, we say, well, it's the agency, it's the agency. Well, it's <laughs> It's not the agency, if actually the clients are the one who wants to participate, stay under medical adherence, and find that that's actually a place that they want to continue coming to, and that they feel that there is being help, it's being a help for them. So uh, a lot of the responsibility is also on the client. Um, so I think that we have to give credit to that. It's not just the Alamo Aero Resource Center. It's also the client being able to participate in the program. That's it, yeah. Um, that's at the contact information. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to share with you, because I know we're running close to time, is that um, on the exhibit table outside, you have many things that we have for physicians and physicians' offices. Any public area that we can put them on, barber shops, beauty shops, who cares, any place where we can get in and get a foot in. We have our resource guides, the big one, they are bilingual, they're red. You've got one right there. You've got the mini resource guides, those are done for clients, because clients don't be, well, don't be walking around carrying a big book. So those are really for case managers and to be placed in doctor's offices. Then we have pill boxes in order. They're red out there. If you need them for your clients or your patients, take them. That's where they're there for. This year, our program at the Ryan White program got feedback, and they said, the pill boxes are real nice, the color is real pretty, but you only have enough for one pill. You don't have the morning and the evening. We want the boxes that are square that have the, yes. And so we're going, okay, next order. We need to redo that because basically we're here to be able to give you the tools that you need. We also have out there English health diaries and Spanish health diaries where people can write down their CD4 count, their viral load, their next appointment, and it also gives helpful hints about, um, uh, as Jesus said, some medical, uh, some nutritional issues that they may want to talk about. You can write down your questions for your doctor on the next visit, etc. So we do those. We also have 
little cards out there that are saying stay negative. And that's if you've tested and you've tested negative, how to stay negative. And with the behavior, if you go in to test almost as your behavior is going, you continue to do the risky behaviors, but you want to continue to test, it shows you where all the testing uh, sites are, and it really tries to encourage you to also um, stop your risking behaviors. And um, the other part that we do is we have condom trainings. I'm known affectionately as the condom lady. Anybody who needs condoms in the city of San Antonio and wants them free, I will give them to them. And uh, we have both male and female condoms available. And it was uncanny to me that about two years ago, two to three years ago, we held the first condom training um, and we had professionals, nurses coming in and outreach workers. When I started, when the epidemic, I'm 67, when I started with the epidemic in the mid 80s, that was the only tool we had. That was before antiretroviral therapy. And the only tool you had for behavior change is to convince somebody to use a condom. And so condoms were my life. That was what you did in public health. And that's the only, you had to be good at it. We did it on bananas, on cucumbers. We did demonstrations on anything that would stand up straight. Right? Absolutely. And I'm not afraid to say that. And um, now we have the female condom. And I was very surprised at how many health professionals have never seen a female condom, much less know how to tell their women to use it. And what happens in the, when somebody asked us about the rise in syphilis, I would give you my answer. And my answer is African American and Latino women do not know how to ask their man, tell me where your penis has been. They cannot do that. We haven't engaged in the skills. We haven't done enough sexual health in our communities for women to be empowered in order to do that. So until Latina and African American women in our communities who are suffering disproportionately from these rates of STDs can ask a man, tell me where your penis has been, and not get cachatadas because of it, then, then we would have come to a place. And one of the things that we can teach them is how to use a female condom as another alternative. Sometimes the price is prohibitive, so that's why we buy them and we give them out free. There are also materials distribu distribution forms. We give out the hand sanitizers, we give out the keychains, because some of the community offense we go to won't allow us to distribute condoms, churches, um, high schools, places like that. So we still want to have the kids to make sure that they know that they can do HIV210.org. So if you've got an event coming up, if you want some things for your office, or if you want to be, be, know somebody who owns a beauty shop, a barber shop, any place where people gather. And the last thing that we did was exceedingly innovative, I think, and that is our fotonovela. And this is an old cultural artifact of, of my generation in the Latino community. And some of them remember your grandmothers and your mothers reading, it, this was before telenovela was really, popu was really popular. They used to read the fotonovela. And we have them for, we divided them in three areas. This is a fotonovela for jovencitas. And that is for young women, um, 18, and it's about a, boy and a girl trying to negotiate. It's English on one side, Spanish on the other. We did focus groups with young girls. And what they all say is, he's the love of my life. Of course I'm going to have sex with him without a condom if that's what he's required. And because they don't know how to love themselves first. The theme of this is a dialogue around a, a, a girl and a young man having that encounter with a very different, with her saying, I love you, but I won't sleep with you without a condom. And it also gives you where to go test it. And at the end, he walks away. And I like the ending on this one because it says, um, it shows her using the app on the, the texting, going back and forth. And um, it, I think his name is Marco. And because um, she's saying she wants to negotiate condom usage. And at the ba back, he said, she said, I guess I lost him. And then at the end, he comes back and he said, you know, you are worth it. It says, it says, Marcus says, sorry for how I acted yesterday. 
K, if I meet you at your house, I want to talk. And the, and the uh, text back is, apology accepted, see you there. So there is happy endings when young women can stand their ground. And so this is a very positive, this is the one. Now, we got some feedback on this one because this one is for the uh, damas. And those are, you know, you've gone to the restrooms and say damas, women's restroom. This is for women, middle-aged women. And when they pick it up, what does it look like to you? Avon book, exactly. And so they're going, you know, you can put, you can put this, you can put this in, the, in the doctor's waiting room and they'll pick it up and going, oh, this is something, you know, this is something interesting to read. This is something sexy. And they read it and look what it says. It has condoms in it. It's like how you attach it to your purse. You know, how you can do the kind of things. And it's really set up. And the storyboard is set up very interesting in how women can take control of their health. And it talks openly about condoms. And it talks openly about where you can go and get resources. And these colors here were very significant to our focus group. We went through, in health literacy, we went through a lot of community input in order to, this is a product of the San Antonio community. And the last one, we have the star in our midst. And the last one, uh, yes, Lucia is the, and she'll do autographs, by the way. I think she's charging $5. All proceeds go to, never mind. Uh, and so Lucia's, yeah, all proceeds go to Lucia. She needs a new handbag. No, um, and then um, um, Liz, who was here. Oh, there you are, and you moved. Liz Mama is the other one on here, and Liz's mama is a breast cancer survivor. And so they were needed to what we call Vonias. Yours truly is one, too. And it's just like, there, because of Viagra, we're having sex. I know that disappoints many of our children, but we are, anyway. <laughs> and so we went to, uh, I think they were getting ready to do the shooting of this and needed another partner for Lucia to be talking to. Liz's mother said, I don't know anything about HIV. It was a beautiful sharing of, why would I talk about that? Yo soy una señora ya grande, no hablamos de eso. I'm an older woman, we don't talk about those things. I mean, I can talk to you about breast cancer because I'm a survivor, but not sexual things. And then when Liz shared with her, to her mama, mama, just like you want people to understand about breast cancer, to get checked and prevention, ¿por qué no con VIH? And, her, and why not for HIV? And her mother said, you know, mija, you're right. And so it's Liz's mama who is the other person on this. These were very personal to us because they came from our comunidad. They're not going to be any good unless you help us get them out to community. They don't need to go to those who are already HIV positive. They need to go in your doctor's offices. They need to go in beauty shops. Uh, laundromats, they need to go anywhere you can help us, colleges, university, to get them out. And they're totally bilingual and they have all the resources for where you can get tested. So at the county, what we try to do with our Ryan White program is worth, work with partners. And one of our largest partner is the HIV Syphilis Prevention Task Force. If you have time, we meet the first Wednesday of every month to educate ourselves to develop the policies and the procedures, to do the networking, to do community events in order to do something about the problem in San Antonio. So it's the HIV Syphilis Testing Task Force, and then you have all the programs uh, that we fund. And I think uh, the panel here proves it's not one person doing it alone. It is in collaboration and cooperation. And I will tell you, that dishes and several other people, including the federal government, have come down and saying, in most communities throughout the United States, because there is funding involved, people are very, very competitive, and they don't talk to each other, and they don't form coalitions and don't do collaborations well, and they want to know what our secret is. And I say, we feed people at our meetings. Never mind. <laughs> Yes, sir.
Our, our provider has noticed a lot of a large increase in just in general people coming across from Piedras uh, because of the there's quite a bit of violence in Piedras right now. Uh, so another thing that's happened in Eagle Pass is a lot of people are tested really late. Um, so some of the people who've tested have had HIV probably for a very, very long time. At least a third, if not greater, uh, closer to 40% in Eagle Pass are coming in with AIDS-defining conditions. Uh, so they're just really late to care. Um, and another thing is um, the state of Texas actually started uh, counting cases differently. Uh, so instead of looking at where the person was diagnosed initially, they're looking at where that person lives now. So what's going on is a lot of folks uh, in Eagle Pass have moved there to go back home uh, because they get so sick that they want to go home. So they've uh, left the, and moved to Dallas. Uh, they've moved. Uh, we do have some immigrant uh, migrant workers who have HIV in Eagle Pass. So uh, sometimes they could have been diagnosed in you know Michigan or wherever, and. Uh, now they come back home because they're so sick. Uh, that's wh where a lot of the uh, happens so in Eagle Pass. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and if you notice the detention centers around in the rural areas, a lot of them get released and they're really sick, and so they stay in those rural yeah. areas. You know what our detention centers, where they're located in? in state and Victoria actually has a, um, a much better late to care rate. So theirs is about 20, 25%. So fewer people are um, in Victoria are being tested super late. The, the bad thing about Victoria is we don't fund testing in Victoria. Uh, we do fund HIV testing in Eagle Pass because of that late to care problem. Um, Victoria, we don't. And there's very limited uh, HIV testing there. Um, they do have a good DIS worker out there, uh, and because they did have a syphilis outbreak a few years ago in Victoria. Uh, and she worked very, she works very closely with our agency to do partner notification and follow up. They, Victoria did recently have four newly diagnosed uh, younger people. One, uh, and they are still experiencing late to care. Um, what, uh, because I think one of them had actually passed away within three months of diagnosis. Um, There's another one that in the Eagle Pass area, the initiative they're going to start with their EIS is going to the Eagle Ford Shell camps because mm -hmm. prostitutes yeah. are now coming yeah. in, or sex workers are now coming in both times, are coming in as well as substance abuse in order to service the people that are in the Shell, Shell Ford uh, 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 areas, and that's very much in that rural area around Eagle Pass. And so that those, we may see a spike. Our, our Victoria and Eagle Pass areas are diametrically opposed. They're, they're quite different areas. Our Victoria area is actually the highest income of our three areas. Uh, we have quite a few clients out there who have some fairly high incomes, and a lot of them are working, and they have a much more diverse population in Victoria. Uh, they actually have people who are, who've immigrated from Africa, who've immigrated from Vietnam and all sorts of other places. And uh, so that's one thing. And uh, Eagle Pass is fairly, is, is our, our most, our, our poorest area by far. Uh, and there's very limited resources in Eagle Pass. Victoria actually has a fairly good medical center. Eagle Pass is very limited in the resources that they have. Uh, so actually, they receive quite a bit more money than Victoria because of the rate of poverty, which is. I, I think Sion has just a few closing uh, resources for you. Yeah, just just a couple of things because we're really with the whole syphilis thing comes that whole congenital piece, and the number of babies that we actually lost last year as a result of. So what I brought with me was the press release that Dr. Schlenker um, put out on January the 9th. I have copies of that. And then also the letter that he drafted to the providers in the area trying to encourage that third trimester uh, testing. We are already at case five for congenital for this year. That's way too many. Will you put those on the table? I will. I will. So can we give our, our uh, cooperative group a very round of
Come on, y'all. Oh, you want a picture of you? Yeah. Okay. Right here? Or? Yes. I need to bring it up higher. Come on. Yes, it's a picture time. Picture time. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, we're almost done. I just have a few things we want to wrap up. Um, I wanted to point out inside the um, portfolios that we left at all the tables, we had materials. Um, some of them were actually to help you implement routine testing or else to share with people who are interested in implementing routine testing. All the materials are available from DSHS, the warehouse, for free. The only one that is not is the coding guide. It was um, published by the AMA and the American Association of HIV Medicine. So, but we have provided these for you to use. Um, the ones that have been very popular, especially for healthcare settings, is this make HIV routine testing in your practice because it speaks directly to the medical provider. Um, also, people are very interested in the data. So this is a snapshot. The data is from um, through 2011. We'll be updating this probably by the end of the summer for the 2012 data. And then, of course, we all need to be protected by the law, so it goes into the details of that. Inside the pockets, we have just um, created a new um, design for education. The first one is for the provider, and inside it has a list of the codes. So if they want to bill, this is the codes. They would give it to their um, they charge capture people or the ones who do the billing, not the ones that get the reimbursement. Um, this is for your patient. Um, we were just at the TextMed and talked with a lot of providers, and this, not just for the patients, I think it's a great thing for the providers who aren't as well-versed. It has a lot of the frequently asked questions, well, there are not that many. What are the symptoms? How can I protect myself and loved ones? How, do I, how often do I get tested, and what if I'm positive? So it just has a few questions with answers that helps the provider be a little more um, versed to talk to their patients about HIV and the importance of routine testing. Also in your um, packet, we had the evaluation. I just want to address that quickly. Um, we applied for continuing education credits only for Dr. Holly's talk, Dr. McCarthy, and then the panel. So that hopefully will explain why there aren't other questions. We did the application through our DSHS CE office, and they kind of direct our evaluation. So please, if there's anything else about the meeting that you want to share about the other um, presenters, I know Dr. Mangala did a great job with the um, regional data here, talked about being in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, um, the World Health Organization. You know, please make those comments. We, we'd love to hear that. And then we can also help us with planning. So if you are requesting continuing education, be sure to complete this and leave it on the table as you leave on that, where you signed in to register. And then last is this handout. It says, Routine HIV Testing as a Standard of Care Implementation Essentials. It has our website. We have a recently released website specifically for routine testing. At DSHS, um, we've really had prevention services, STD. I mean, we never had anything for routine testing in medical healthcare settings, so now we do. And this short little slide, basically I've given you all the things you would want to consider to plan to implement a routine testing program. We've added the links, the hot links, so if you wanted to go straight to the health and safety code, if you want to go straight to the CDC guidelines, um, we have all of those links as well as some of the other um, useful handouts, materials that you would share with leadership that would make the decisions rather to support it or not. So if we just want to move along, just to bring it back, um, the source of all HIV tests and HIV positives that have been identified, this is old, the National Health Interview Survey from 2006, and then the supplement of the HIV AIDS surveillance from 2000, 2003. I wish someone would update it. But you can see the majority of the tests are done in medical settings. We've got your private doctor, the hospital ED, the outpatient, and community health clinic. 53% of the test, 18 and 5%. And then when you're looking at the positives that are identified, 17 by the private doctor, 27 in your hospital ED outpatient setting, and then 21 in your community clinic. So really, that is the place to test. That's where people are being identified. And the, the beauty of that is they are 
connected with that healthcare provider. I was having a question about the early intervention services, but it's more of a, a program to help people stay into care. But I keep hearing over and over that when people have um, a diagnosis of HIV, that first appointment is just to have blood work done. The next appointment might be to talk to um, a case manager about what's going to go on. But it's not until the third appointment or after that they actually meet with a healthcare provider. I was talking to Dr. Holly about that, and it's like, it's that whole development, developing a relationship, that trust. And sometimes the reason people never really engage in care or they don't stay in it is because maybe if they had had that initial meeting with their doctor, build that relationship, that trust, for them to instill in them why it's important to stay in care, we might have more people that stay in care. So that is something, I think, to talk about, to think about. I know a lot of it has to do with funding, you know, how many minutes does this doctor have to be able to spend with a patient. But sometimes I think, especially with public health issues, that we kind of need to rethink that. And who knows, we might change the world. So next slide. Um, I wanted to draw your attention. I don't know if any of you saw the New York Times article last Sunday. Um, it's called People Think It's Over, Spare Death, Aging People with HIV Struggle to Live. It was a very interesting article because it discusses the lives of two people who were identified early in the epidemic, and basically when they were diagnosed with AIDS, they were basically trained to think that they were going to die. Well, they lived long enough that they went into the different clinical trials, the different medications, and they lived. And then along comes, you know, 1996 when the miracle drugs come. And now it's like they had come to a point where they were going to close their life. They had done everything they wanted to. And it's like, oh, I'm going to live. <laughs> so now what do I do? But because of that, they are aging. And they have many of the same diseases that anyone who ages has. They've, next. Um, cancer, heart disease, especially cancer in um, patients with HIV AIDS. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is very common. Just they are typically, um, it's an inflammatory disease. So I think that ART, the antiretroviral treatment, it causes a lot of inflammation that also accompanies age. So they do have these same um, illnesses, sometimes a little bit earlier than people are as they age. But cancer, heart disease, strokes, lung disease, kidney failure, diabetes, hello. Um, high blood pressure, thyroid, arthritis, um, the neurocognitive decline and memory loss, and then just the general weakness, fatigue, depression, and anxiety. And you could talk about any person as they're aging and as they get older and older, these are common things. Well, people living with HIV AIDS, it's even more so because they have the HIV to com you know, make it more complicated. So the importance, I think, I feel, is that they do engage in medical care that they go to a physician who can manage all of these. You know, they're aware of it, and they have relationships with specialists that they can refer them out to, because they're going to live a long time, and you want them to have a healthy life, to not, you know, compromise their health. So that's just a little um, plug on that. But I think it's a really good article. It'll be worth it. It was, um, the, I guess, in the Sunday Magazine, June 3rd, the New York Times. So next. Um, I just wonder, I think we said this before, that it's a physician's duty to promote the patient's welfare and to improve the public's health. So it's fostered through routinely testing your adult patients for HIV. And the medical community recognized this back in 2006. I don't know that everyone got the message. And so it's the people who are working with HIV and the prevention um, and care services that we need to continue to share this message that it is, it's part of medicine. HIV is a chronic disease. It's it's treatable. You need to help your patients manage their, their, um, their health. Next. So when we are thinking about implementing routine testing, the first thing you want to ask yourself, do I serve the population that needs to be tested? So what is the age? Um, I was, I think Dr. McCarthy was talking about the people he was going to do some targeted testing by zip code. The, um, to determine if you have a 0.1% or higher, they say that you need to test over 4,000 patients to really get that, that good number. It's a statistically sound number that's saying you're testing enough people to say, no, I don't have enough people, so I don't need to do routine testing. I'll just do based on my risk, how I interview my clients. But you know, identifying who that population is and if it's positive you know, to go ahead and implement testing. 
Um, the patient consent process has always been something that people at the beginning of a program, they want to know, well, what do we do? How do we get it in our general consent? Um, some of the programs, they do signage. Some actually write in the HIV test in their general consent. Others just say, you know, this is, they've consented to any of the care that I recommend. I recommend HIV testing, so they take care of it that way. And the important piece is that it's documented in the chart that they were informed. Next. Um, testing technology, uh, Dr. McCarthy also shared the story of the point of care testing. In some, it takes so much um, individual oversight to process one test that if you're seeing a lot of patients, a lot of rapid turnover, you probably don't have the dedicated staff to be doing that. What we have learned, um, with bang per buck, the conventional blood draw, if you're drawing blood, you're getting a lot of other stuff, a CBC, liver enzymes, cholesterol, it's one extra tube of blood. Some, they don't even need a whole, you know, if they're doing a red top, they, sometimes they call it the speckle top, it's from the same tube and you know you're only pulling out, you know, a couple of milliliters, you can have enough blood to run the sample twice as well as pull enough to do we used to do the Western blot, now we're doing the multi-spot, which I don't think even, maybe even less blood. So you wanna make sure you have enough sample to do the, posit the first preliminary positive, confirm it, then enough for your confirmatory, and then in case it's indeterminate, then you'd want enough to be able to send to have sampled for the, um, the NAT, the RNA or DNA, to determine if you have an acute case. So that's something you always wanna think about is, you know, how, you know, my staff and my, have enough to actually process the point of care? Is it cost effective? Or do I want to do the conventional? Um, Central Med, they send their stuff to LabCorp. They have a sta established population, so they can just send them a letter. We um, have call us to make an appointment to come in and discuss your lab, re lab results. Um, Dr. McCarthy, hey, I'm going back to him for everything, but yes, we have a lot of practices that they want it to be physician driven. And as he said, sometimes the nurses are the ones who have a lot of interaction. They have a little more time with the patients. So they tend to be the ones who can say, have you ever been tested? We're recommending that everyone gets tested. Do you have any questions? So then too, they intend to cross the T's and dot the I's for the doctors they work with. So sometimes a nurse driven model may be a little more practical. I'm delivering test results to patients. How are you going to do that? I know that was a lot of questions. Um, Memorial Hermann, a lot, they do have a very tight relationship with the city of Houston and the DIS go out. Um, some of our hospitals, they actually have a caseworker, a medical caseworker on staff all the time, 24-7. They do the delivery of the results. Um, some even have like, um, not a priest, a minister, whoever's there to help with the psych patients for counseling, they're there to help out. Um, others have their um, coordinator who, that is what they do, that's their specialty. So they are there, they're available, or they have someone back up, or they use flex time. You know, I had to go in and meet a patient at 2 a.m. I was there till 5, so I'm not going to come into work tomorrow until 3 o'clock. <laughs> but so that somebody can give them that face-to-face -face, um, notification of their positive test results. Um, linking and confirming the care of the, the patients. Some hospitals are not affiliated with the fax clinic, like University Health. So what do they do? We have a perfect example in Beaumont, Texas, Dr. Holly, but they, Baptist Hospital didn't have a clinic. They're just a sort of like Memorial Hermann, a nonprofit um, private hospital. So they've made um, strong partnerships with their local Department of Health. They have their Ryan White funded care services. They've partnered with the um, drug um, abuse and mental health program. And so they, they work together. Um, they meet monthly to discuss, you know, who, how many people have been um, diagnosed positive, if they've linked to care. They, they stay in touch to go, yes, um, the woman that was deaf and had cancer, <laughs> yes, she, she's made her appointments and she's been in care now for six months. I mean, and they actually have such good relationships and since they do make that effort to meet every month, they do, they see how many are engaged in care and if someone misses an appointment, they're a small enough community, their um, partnership is so tight that they are able to go and follow up with their patients. Smaller community, I know big, huge metropolitan areas, it's very hard to do that, but, um, they're, they work on that partnership monthly. Um, the disease, disease intervention specialists are especially helpful in those settings where you don't have um, 
someone who's on payroll to do that. They're not there 24-7 like a hospital might. And then reporting positive cases to the local health department. Um, Dr. Holly had a great system where it's just automatic. Um, one thing in Texas, we do have that redundant requirement. So the lab, if it's sent off to a lab, they have to report to the state as well. So we do have the physician or whoever they designate within their facility to report as well as the lab. So we know that if somebody forgot or paper got lost that there's going to be redundant reporting. Um, sustaining routine testing. Um, it's so important to have a champion. When I met Dr. Holly, I was in Beaumont trying to find the CEO at the hospital because we learned that if you go at the top, if that, if that leader buys into it, it's gonna trickle down. If you go in at the back door or across the street, it's really hard to have that communication to the people in the departments that need to run the program. So I met him and he called up the CEO and said, hey, will you call, talk with Ms. Clark? And, he said he would, and it was just, it was that easy. He, they had a meeting. They said, is this important? Is it a chronic disease? They agreed it was a chronic disease, and I got a phone call from the director of the emergency department and said, they told me to call you. What do we need to do? So it was like, you know, and that's what we hear the stories. Um, Lisa Fitzpatrick, she's a physician in Washington, D.C. She's been very active in the HIV AIDS field, the community. And that's what she's saying. To have successful programs, you have to have the leadership at the top because they're the ones who say, yes, it's our mission. Yes, we're going to devote the time, the energy. It's something that we care about. And so that's how they've been successful, how they're able to make changes. If something in the program isn't working, you've got the support at the very top. It's, um, it's, it's very simple, but it's very, very hard to get that connection and the time for that person to, to listen to you. Um, the IT coding and changes, I know we have mixed feelings about that. Um, if we could all have our custom EMR, life would be great. Um, but tweaking the programs, if you can actually, I know Matt's no longer here, but he's with University Health, and when he finally found the right person at UHS to talk to about pulling together the right da data to submit to the state, his life became much easier, and we got our data much more quickly. So it's navigating these huge bureaucratic systems and finding the people to talk to, which is very hard, but um, if you can get that person at the top, they know who all to go to. They'll give you a name. It seems to be much easier. Um, billing, coding, and reimbursement. With the grade A recommendation, we hope that life will be a little easier for doing routine testing. We won't say that I can't do this for free. We can't take the cost. We can't cover it. So we hope that's going to be something that's going to change. Um, training on this um, sheet here, we do have some links to available trainings because you're constantly having to train your staff. We know that at UHS they have residents, we've got interns that are just going through the emergency department. You constantly change. People, you know, they're, they may want to move to take care of an aging parent. They get married, they move away. You're always going to have new people in and having a, a a routine training that some of our programs are starting a web-based training. So basically, if someone new, they can take this 20-minute web-based training to just give you an overview of the program. Some of them are doing like employee orientations. So there are just these rote trainings. Um, Pam Green at Memorial Hermann, she meets every month with the different nursing staffs at all the different hospitals, and she has her little training PowerPoint, and she just goes through it. It's, I think, about 10 minutes. It, she just goes over it because there's always going to be one or two new nurses on staff. She shows them the, the testing results, how they compare their site to all the others, and just really keeps them engaged. It's kind of a constant, um, until it becomes totally routine and people go, yeah, I'm going to do an HIV test just like blood pressure, you constantly need to keep communicating with the people that are performing the direct services. Um, and then quality assurance activities, we just added a new QA plan that we've given to our sites. And we were a little worried because nobody wants to talk about doing quality assurance and getting monitored. But I got the opposite, the people embraced it because it was like a road map. Here are the best practices. Here are the, the links to help support us to get there. One of them went, you know, I didn't even think about training. <laughs> We've just been trying to tell people to do more testing. So it gave them a way to just step back and look at the whole program and fill in where they had gaps and 
we're always there to help. I mean, that's our job. Um, we're a little passionate about it, but believe that, you know, whatever we know we want to share with you to help you have a successful program because the more people we test, the positives get into care, we know that we're going to decrease the transmission rate and lower your community viral load. You'll have a much healthier community, more money to spend on other chronic disease. And so that's kind of what this is for to help you, your roadmap and our website. And I think that might, well, ditto, I think I already said that. So I, I, one thing I didn't say, I think what I was supposed to put there is I, I quote her all the time, Lisa Fitzpatrick. She actually was over the PEPFAR when Haiti had the um, earthquakes. And, but she's been very much involved in HIV AIDS care. And she was interviewed. And her thing is that she says, if you can get people living with HIV AIDS into care, any care, we can prevent AIDS. So if you can get someone early, or even someone who hasn't advanced to AIDS, if you can get them into care and healthy, they may never ever develop into you know, having an AIDS diagnosis. So I think that's a very powerful statement, and the potential that we have now with all the things that have occurred, I'd say this last year, is, is making us get that much closer to it. So hopefully you have, getting, have just have a different view of routine testing, what it is, and that it's, it is just as important. Um, we're not saying that the counseling and testing or the going out for the um, different health fairs or testing days, that is really important. But routine testing in healthcare settings are for those people who think, I'm not at risk. I don't know anyone who has HIV. It wouldn't be me. Or for the doctors that go, not my patients. But as we saw, that's where the majority of the people are being tested and identified as positive or in that, that healthcare setting. So I think that's all I had to say. If, if you all have any questions, um, let us know. Our contact information, we're, we're going to be providing the slides. Yes, so um, what you have, so just a reminder about your evaluations, and you'll go ahead and turn those in since we're finishing up. But on behalf of the planning committee and the sponsors that provided this opportunity for us in San Antonio, the first time opportunity, actually, um, we'd like to thank you for staying with us throughout the whole day. We know it's been a long day. It's been a very, very tiring. But um, for those of you who uh, were not registered for payment today or new registers, please be sure that we have your email addresses, your contact information for a couple of different reasons. We want to keep you updated on any questions that you might have with regards to the information that was given to you today, with regards to your status, um, anything like that that we need to follow up with you after the, after the summit. Um, you notice that we have cameras here, and that is actually a sponsorship donation by now, pathfa.org. Is that correct? Um, so we have been able to live stream the presentation today for those people that were not able to make it at the last minute. We had a couple of physicians that were not able to call the way and couldn't come at the last minute, but they were able to at least visit us online. They didn't get the, the privilege of getting to see you what you guys did. But um, they have some of the information. We will also be sending you the link to that. Um, so for those of you that want to share the information to your colleagues that didn't come here today, um, we'll send you that link so that you can get that out. And we have been given permission by the presenters today to provide you um, with a link to the information. And Dr. Mangum has also provided us the um, permission to send you his uh, PowerPoint slides. Um, so that was the first presentation from San Antonio Metro Health. And so we have your contact information up front. We'll be able to send that to you. Um, Vera Landero is our operations manager right over there. Vera, you can say hi. Um, and then Denise Bennett is our program, program manager. And uh, I'm Elizabeth. And so we will be very happy to continue to, to help you, uh, continue to provide information um, through the planning committee and through the development team. <laughs> Um, we're very excited about having had this opportunity today. Again, we thank you for being here.